Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Duminda Bunidasa, President, Ceylon College of Physicians. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this very timely webinar on uh, the anaphylaxis, the killer allergy. This, as you all must be agreeing, that the timely discussion to be taken place because of the recent incidents. And actually, Ceylon College of Physicians felt that this uh, very important uh, topic in way back in 2015, uh, under the guidance of Education Training and Research Committee of that time of Ceylon College of Physicians, has developed a module to give confidence in diagnosis and treatment, prompt treatment of anaphylaxis to save lives. At that time, it was developed by a group of uh, panelists, uh, include Dr. Chandimani Dugodage, Dr. Nirmala Vijayko, Pro, uh, Professor Piyusha Atapatu, Professor Diniti Fernando, and Professor uh, Sudhir as well as Professor Nilika Malavidi. There were few changes since then probably in the guidelines. So this year, we at this moment, we have handed it over to Professor Pandu Karnanayaka, Dr. Suranga Mavilgama, and Dr. Chamila Dalpadadu to do a new version using the our with gratitude to our previous uh, module to run this uh, webinar today. So make sure that you take all the uh, necessary uh, input from this, make sure that you are confident in what diagnosing, what is this anaphylaxis is and how quickly and how you should treat it. So to take over the, the presentations, I would like to invite Professor Pandu Karnanayaka, uh, Professor in Medicine, University of uh, Colombo, to start the webinar. Over to you, Pandu. Thank you very much, uh, Duminda, for that introduction. Uh, uh, can you see me? Okay, good. Let me uh, share my slides with you. Thank you very much. Uh, my thanks to um, the, the Ceylon College of Physi Physicians on behalf of both myself and my two colleagues, Suranga and Chamila. Uh, so we put together this uh, training module, uh, and uh, Duminda, you've already explained the importance of this. We all appreciate that. So basically, this module is addressed to all medical officers who are working in any ward or outpatient department because they are the first doctors who come across patients with anaphylaxis in a hospital, whether it's state sector or private sector. So what we want to do is to explain how to quickly identify anaphylaxis, how to immediately manage anaphylaxis, especially with regard to how to use adrenaline without any personal fear, and also how to identify this condition called refractory anaphylaxis and what to do. We will also try to briefly explain the differential diagnosis of anaphylaxis and how long a patient should be kept under observation after stabilization. Uh, but I think the first three points, the quick identification, immediate management, and identification and uh, of refractory anaphylaxis are the two main things that we have to um, worry about uh, in a case of anaphylaxis. Um, so, uh, by way of acknowledgement, uh, this training module is an updated version of previous modules that were developed, edited, and presented by uh, our colleagues, uh, Dr. Chandimani Udukutage, Dr. Nipalaj Jekon, Prof. Pilcha Tapattu, Prof. Dinti Panandu, Prof. Nilika Malavige, Prof. Udiranavaka, who were then later joined by Dr. Uput Sanayaka also, uh, which they did on behalf of the Education Training and Research Committee of the CCP. And we've been doing this from 2015 to 2019 every year. And uh, for about three years, it was not happening, but we are now going to restart it. Uh, these are our three main references. And we would very much recommend uh, the, the first two journal articles, first two documents for, for you if you want any further details, because they are very nice articles. One is from the, uh, the, the Solicitation Council of the UK. The second is from the World Allergy Organization and Alexis uh, Group. Uh, and the Harrison's, uh, which we all know about, is also has a very good chapter on it. And the outline of this talk is, I'm first going to present to you five case histories, uh, 
Um, let's just see if we can spot the anaphylaxis in some of them. And then we'll get on to how to quickly identify anaphylaxis, how to make the diagnosis. At that point, I will hand over to Dr. Suranga Manilgama, who will deal with how to quickly stabilize the patient and what to do if you find that there's refractory anaphylaxis. And thereafter, Dr. Chamda Dalpadar will take over and uh, discuss what to do once the patient is stabilized. And before we start, our most important message for you is anaphylaxis is potentially fatal. To save life, we must identify it quickly and treat it promptly, and every minute is precious. And the single most important life-saving medication is intramuscular adrenaline, IEM adrenaline, uh, using the one in 1000 solution. Uh, it's known as epinephrine in the USA, so some books will use that name. And the, the term, the, the name adrenaline can be spelled with or without the last E, both are acceptable spellings. Uh, so our task as a doctor is to quickly stabilize the patient and after stabilization to continue to monitor the patient for some time. And uh, if the patient is having what's called refractory anaphylaxis, which is a new term that is coming into use now, then we must learn how to quickly identify that also and to take appropriate steps. So this is our most important message. Most of all, we know that there's a certain fear or concern about using adrenaline. So I, I hope that at the end of this um, uh, training module, you would have confidence in using adrenaline where required and in the manner that, they should be, that it should be used. So this is our life-saving drug. Adrenaline this is a small vial with one ml, one milliliter of the one in 1000 solution. Okay, so let me share with you some case histories. Uh, this is uh, basically some of these have anaphylaxis and some don't. So let's see if you can diagnose the cases which are having anaphylaxis. I mean, I won't be asking you questions. I'm just asking you to read it and make a note of yourself. Case one, two, three, four, five. Yes or no for each one. Later on, I will explain to you how to make the diagnosis and also we will we revisit the cases as well. So uh, to start with, there's no pressure. Just answer this question to yourself. Case one, uh, you can read this. So the important point in this case history is that we know that the patient was given a medication that could cause an allergic reaction uh, to negative place. And soon afterwards, the patient developed skin features like itching, uh, uh, lip swelling, and an urticarial rash. The BP was 120, 90, pulse rate was 100, and there was no breathlessness and the lungs were clear. So this is a photograph of an urticarial rash in a dark-skinned person. Um, I'm sure all of you have seen urticarial rashes, but I thought I'd just show it uh, just in case. You can see that this is a, it's a cutaneous rash, not a subcutaneous rash, and the, the center is very pale. For example, here you can see a pale center and a surrounding erythema. So this is our case one. And think for yourself, is this anaphylaxis or not? Case one, yes or no. I'll move on to case number two. So here again, we know that this patient was recovering from his pneumonia. He was doing quite well. And he too got a uh, medication, in this case, tetraxone. And he began shouting soon afterwards, two minutes afterwards. And he became breathless and faintish. The BP is 80 by 50, pulse rate 120, lungs had wheezing or bronchi, but the skin was normal. So write down whether case number two is anaphylaxis or not. And I will move on to case number three. Now again, uh, she, uh, here also the patient who is a consultant physician, uh, she knew that she was allergic to the bite of red ants. Um, she was on some medications and her usual BP was 150 by 90. That's a very important point here. And she saw that she was bitten by an ant. Uh, and then about five minutes later, she got some symptoms, uh, feeling very warm and faintish and uh, palpitations. She immediately went to the closest ward close by. And then the BP was 100 by 80, pulse rate was 120, and the lungs were clear, and there was no rash. So tell, uh, note down whether case three is anaphylaxis or not. And now go to case number four. So again, she knows she is allergic to beef. She may have eaten beef, we don't know for sure, but she did definitely became unwell soon afterwards. 
because she had repeated vomiting and crampy abdominal pain. Uh, and of course, she had this flushing of the skin and the skin was very warm, red and flat. Uh, feeling very warm is a common symptom when the cutaneous blood flow is increased. And on examination, you would find that it is red and flat. And the flushing is, of course, blanching on pressure. Her BP was 110 by 70, pulse rate by 90, no restlessness. And I took a photo from um, the internet just to show you what flushing looks like. Uh, I mean, you can see this patient's face, the cheek and the lower jaw area is having a uniform redness. And if someone were to press with the thumb, you would find that they are big branching on pressure. So this is the rash that this patient would have had something like this, but in a generalized way. That is our case number four. So note down whether your case number four is, in, uh, in your opinion, having anaphylaxis or not. And then this is the final case, case number five. So he's a school teacher and was teaching in the class, suddenly fell and was brought to hospital. Uh, obviously that would have taken about 10 minutes or maybe even more than that. And uh, he doesn't have any known allergies, doesn't, can't remember any exposures uh, of anything, but he has a generalized urticarial rash in the skin and the blood pressure is 60 by 40, which is understandable because to come from, to be brought from school to hospital, you have to find the transport and everything. This kind of patient, when they come to hospital, can sometimes be very late, and therefore can have very low BP and the pulse rate is 120 and the lungs are clear. So uh, note down whether you think case number four is having anaphylaxis. And with that, let's uh, move on to the next section, how to quickly identify anaphylaxis. Basically, anaphylaxis is this. It's a combination of two things. The first is a type one hypersensitivity reaction. Now we have all heard of uh, hypersensitivity. There are five types uh, of which type one is one what's happening here. And we just call it allergic reaction uh, for short because normally the word allergic reaction is used for type one reactions, which is actually not very true because you would have heard this condition called allergic contact dermatitis that, uh, that we see in dermatology, which is actually type four. But anyway, for common parlance, we call it uh, uh, allergic reaction. So that's the first component, a type one hypersensitive reaction. The second component is a systemic involvement. So I'm going to give you details of what these two are. If you, if you talk about the allergic uh, the type one re reaction, and that's a very important point, the fact that it's type one because it is due to an allergen and type one reactions are very rapid, very fast. So the onset is only second to minutes after the exposure, maybe a few hours sometimes, but generally seconds to minutes after exposure. And the progression is very rapid. It rap progresses rapidly over minutes to hours. And it involves the skin or mucous membranes in about 80 to 90% of patients, uh, which is a vast majority. However, we must keep in mind that in about 10 to 20% of patients, the skin or mucous membrane is not involved. So that's about the type 1 hypersensitive reaction or the allergic reaction. That is the first component. The second component is a systemic involvement, which basically means the patient must have at least one of the following three. airway problems, breathing problems, or circulation problems. So allergic reaction plus any one of the three is defined as anaphylaxis. Basically, it is not really a defini definition because, to be honest with you, if you look at the literature, there are various definitions given to anaphylaxis. but we thought this is the simplest way to learn to identify anaphylaxis. Just the patient have an allergic reaction and is there a systemic involvement? And the allergic reaction must be a type 1 reaction, which is basically uh, seconds to minutes after exposure, rapidly progresses in minutes to hours, uh, and usually involves the skin or mucous membranes, but not always. And when you say systemic involvement, it must either cause airways problems or cause breathing problem or cause circulation problems. Right, let me tell you some common allergens with regard to medications. Any medication can do that, but the common ones are antibiotics, blood or blood products, including anti sera such as an anti-venom serum or anti-rabies serum and so on, as well as albumin, uh, biological agents, uh, what are called biologics nowadays, NSAIDs, dextrans, opioids, vaccines, streptokinase, radio contrast agents, even antiseptics like rohexidine, which is used during surgery, and drug ingredients such as polyethylene glycol or methyl cellulose, which are added to medications as an as a excipient, they also can cause allergic reactions. And there are many food sources. Common foods include uh, egg, egg white, especially in children, house milk, fish, meat, nuts, especially peanuts, 
Selfish, selfish is very common in Asian countries as a cause of uh, hyperphilaxis. Sometimes foods, oil beans and wheat. Third category is insect sting, such as bees, wasps, and ants. And there are other causes also, like for example, alcohol, latex, pollen, pet hair, and various physical factors such as cold, uh, warm weather, and so on. So sometimes the patient may have a known allergy, sometimes they won't. Sometimes they may know that they are exposed, sometimes they might not. So all, of, all possibilities are, are possible. So if you take the consultant physician who got um, stung by the red ant, she knew about the allergy and she saw that she was stung by the ant. So that is she is in box number one here. If you take the woman who ate the pastry at the party and got the rash, she knew about the allergy, but she wasn't sure about the exposure because we don't know for sure whether it contained beef or not. If you look at the patient with pneumonia who was given cleptraxone, uh, uh, he did not have any known allergy, but we knew that there was exposure to a possible allergy. And the school teacher in the class who collapsed didn't know, have any allergies and didn't know about any exposures. And the important point is this, this school teacher had a rash. That's very important because when you have a rash in this kind of situation, when there's no known allergy and no known exposure, the presence of a rash is very important for us because we immediately know it must be an allergic reaction. Uh, so if the rash is there, then it sort of comes to our, our help to point to the diagnosis. And this is very important because actually about 30% of patients with anaphylaxis fall into this box. They don't have a known allergy and they don't have a exposure, 30%. And you know, that's why it's so important to look for the rash. Sometimes the rash may, may not be generalized, maybe just a small localized urticarial rash or something like that. So remember that box, 30% of anaphylaxis patients don't have a known allergy or a known exposure. Okay, let's talk about the systemic involvement. What are the airways problems? You can have edema of the tongue or throat so that it causes breathing or swallowing difficulty. You can look at the mouth, ask the patient to open the mouth and see that the tongue is swollen, the flow of the mouth is open and swollen and sometimes even the uvula may be swollen. There can be edema of the epiglottis or larynx causing hoarseness or strido. There can be edema of the epiglottis or the hypopharynx which can cause painful swallowing or odinophagia. What are the breathing problems that can happen? It can cause bronchospasm and increased bronchial secretions, which gives rise to symptoms like chest tightness or wheezing. There will be tachypnea and desaturation to less than 94% on air. And when the condition is very far advanced, the patient can have cyanosis, respiratory fatigue, and respiratory arrest. What are the circulation problems that can happen? They can have low blood pressure, and the criteria would be either a systolic BP of less than 90 or a reduction of systolic BP more than 30% from the baseline. There can be tachycardia, more than 100 beats per minute. There can even be cardiac events, which are sometimes primary cardiac events, such as tachyarrhythmias and ST or TVA changes or myocardial dysfunction on echocardiogram, or can be secondary to shock, such as bradycardia or cardiac arrest. Then the changes in the vascular system include arteriolar dilatation, which gives rise to a reduced effective blood volume because when the, all the arterioles in the body are dilated at the same time, uh, the, the vascular bed becomes so large that your five liters of blood will not be enough to perfuse all the tissues. Therefore, you have what's called effective blood volume reduction. The real blood volume is there, but it's not good enough. And that leads to hypotension and reduced venous return when the, 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 all the blood is pulled in the arterial side and the veins don't have any blood. And therefore, the patient, the heart doesn't have a venous return and the, the heart doesn't have a preload. And patients like this, if they die on postmortem examination, they have what is called the empty heart syndrome. The, inside the ventricles, there is no blood or hardly any blood. At the same time, a small percentage of patients may also have increased capillary permeability, just like in dengue fever, which you rise to fluid leak and an increased hematocrit. Uh, there are other systemic features also, an important part is GI problems, particularly common in anaphylaxis due to insect stings and IV medications, such as on injection. You might remember that recently there was a patient uh, in the Peradina hospital. We know she was given on according to media reports, and we also know that soon after the injection, she had vomiting. So just like that patient, the, the common GI problems are vomiting, crampy abdominal pain, and sometimes also fecal incontinence. And their bubble wall undergoes angioedema. 
And as you know, the bubble is a large organ, it's very long. And if the whole bubble wall suddenly develops angioedema, that gives rise to a lot of extravasation of fluid leading to hypovolemia and very rapid shock. Uh, some guidelines actually consider GIT problem also as part of the systemic involvement. So some guidelines do and some don't, but what's a very really important point is the presence of GIT problems like crampy abdominal pain, vomiting, and fecal incontinence is a very dangerous situation, even if the blood pressure, even if the airways, breathing, circulation are normal. Basically, keep a very low threshold for using adrenaline and keep the adrenaline ready in the syringe, even if you're not going to use it right now. The other system is neurological problems, which causes anxiety, agitation, impending doom, and later on with the shock and hypoxia, they can get confusion, hypotonia, and unconsciousness. There are some factors worsening the reaction or the outcome. It's worse in infancy, adolescence, young adulthood, during labor, especially because they have a lot of surg surgical uh, medications are used, and also during old age. And, and certain concomitant diseases such as asthma, allergic rhinitis, and eczema, and psychiatric illnesses, cardiac disease, and mast cell disorders, and certain concomitant medications such as beta blockers, which actually makes uh, adrenaline ineffective sometimes, ACE inhibitors, which can cause secretion of uh, uh, radikinins and worsen the mediators, NSAIDs, alcohol, sedatives, hypnotics, antidepressants, and even recreational drugs, and other factors such as exercise, disruption of routine such as traveling. Uh, emotional stress, premenstrual tension, and acute infections. These are things which are known to worsen the reaction or the outcome of anaphylaxis. This from anaphylaxis is basically because of systemic involvement giving rise to either shock or hypoxia. So remember, we are worried most about shock and hypoxia, and our effort is to correct the shock and correct the hypoxia. The two red boxes are the things that must be in your mind, shock and hypoxia. Right, so let's now go back to case one. So this was the, the 5 year old man who was in, having an acute MI and was given to inactive place. And five minutes later, got itching all over the body, the urticarial rash and lip swelling. And there was an urticarial rash. And the BP is uh, 120 by 90. Pulse rate is 100 beats per minute. No breathlessness. So if you look at the, uh, uh, the criteria, the ones which are present are given in red. There was allergen exposure, rapid uh, onset, rapid progression, skin involvement. So left-hand side is all there. But on the right-hand side, there's no airways problem, no breathing, and no circulation. And therefore, there's no anaphylaxis. There's only an allergic reaction. Okay, so case number two. Um, do you want to read this? And now that you know, do you want to give your answer to the chat box? You can say yes if it is case uh, anaphylaxis, or you can say no if it is not anaphylaxis. Let's see if who is brave to brave enough to answer the question. Yes, so we have one answer. Yes, that's right. The second case is anaphylaxis. You are quite right. Very good. So on the left hand side, we know it's and there's an allergen. The the injection, uh, quick concept, rapid progression didn't involve the skin. However, there are breathing problems and circulation problems. So it is anaphylaxis. Both sides are, there's something red on both sides. Good. What about the third case? Do you want to answer the third case? Okay, so there is one yes and one no. Okay, and some yeses are appearing. Right, so this is an important situation. Remember I told you that the criterion for hypotension was either less than 90 systolic or 30% reduction of the systolic from the known. Now, this consultant physician knows that her usual BP systolic is 150. So one third of that is 50. It has gone down from 150 to 100. So the systolic has gone down by one third or 30%. So therefore, this 100 by 80 is actually a low BP for her because her usual BP was 150 by 90. So it's very important. If you know the patient's blood pressure or if the patient knows the usual blood pressure, don't wait till the systolic is 90. If it is lowered by one third, that's it. We have got circulation problems. So we have things on the red, red on the left hand side. There's allergen, rapid onset, rapid progression, but no skin involvement. But on the right hand side, 
there's a circulation problem. She has hypotension and, high, and tachycardia, so that's enough to diagnose anaphylaxis. There's red on both sides. What about case number four? So there's one yes. Any more answers? There are more yeses. Uh, one person is not anaphylaxis. Okay, so this is the most difficult case that uh, of the five cases which I'm, I, I have presented here. Now she has an exposure. She knows about the allergy. She, she may have exposure. I'm sorry, because we're not sure about the beef. And she has a skin rash. So the left-hand side is fine. But the problem with the right-hand right side is there is no airway problem, breathing problem, or circulation problem. So this is not anaphylaxis. However, I told you earlier, when there are GIT problems, be very careful. Be very careful. That um, Pira Dene case was, a, uh, uh, I mean, she had GIT problems to start with. In addition, there may have been ABC problems thereafter. So basically, this particular case, according to this, this combination of left and right, doesn't qualify as anaphylaxis. But as I said earlier, when there are GIT problems, be very careful, keep the adrenaline ready, and have a very low threshold for giving adrenaline. In fact, some guidelines actually say this is anaphylaxis, even though not according to what I have been telling you so far. So I, I won't give that answer as a wrong answer if you say it anaphylaxis, uh, but at the same time, until there was an airway or breathing or circulation problem, there is no clear uh, indication to give adrenaline. There, but you better be ready because it could the BP can drop any time. Case number five, what about this? What are your answers? So there's a yes there. More yeses. Yes, lots of yeses again. Very good. So we have caught the important thing. There are there's red on both sides. We didn't know about allergen because he never had a known allergy, he never had exposure. Whatever it is, it's rapid progression and skin is involved. Fortunately for us, the skin is involved. That means there's allergy going on. And there's a circulation problem because the BEP is very low. So remember, look at the left-hand side, look at the right-hand side. Is an allergen exposure there? Is it rapid onset? Is it rapid progression? Is the skin involved? If you have read on the left-hand side, it's an allergic reaction. Then look at the right-hand side. Is there an airways problem or breathing problem or, or circulation problem? If anything is read on the right-hand side, it's an anaphylaxis. Otherwise, it's only an allergic reaction. So this is the spectrum of type 1 reactions uh, from uh, on the left-hand side is a mild one. The right-hand side is a severe one. You can have mild localized skin reactions at the left-hand side, which is a simple one, or even generalized skin reactions. But both these are not anaphylaxis. Or you can have things leading to airway, breathing, or circulation problems, which is when you call anaphylaxis. It may or may not have skin reactions. Right, so the differential diagnosis, there are two life-threatening conditions. One is life-threatening asthma, which is more slow in onset, and the patient would have a history of asthma. And AS inhibitor induced angioedema, so you know the patient is hypertensive and taking AS inhibitors, can also be just like anaphylaxis and uh, treated with uh, adrenaline and sometimes with uh, FFP also. Uh, and there are some non life threatening conditions like angioedema, urticaria, syncope, panic attacks, and mastery disorders. I won't talk about that today. Which it's better not to use these terms like anaphylactic shock, anaphylactic reaction, and serious allergic reaction. And basically, at this point, I'm going to hand over to uh, Dr. Suranga Manilgama, who will take over and tell us about how to quickly stabilize our patient with anaphylaxis. Over to you, Manil. Uh, Suranga, sorry. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, sir. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, we have already discussed uh, how to identify a patient with anaphylaxis. Now, let's move on to the management of uh, a patient with anaphylaxis. So once you diagnose a patient is having anaphylaxis, you, ask, you should ask for help and you should ask for adrenaline. So this is the life-saving medication, IM. The, it, is, it should be given intramuscularly, IM, and the strength is one in 100,000, one in 1,000. And where to give is anterolateral mid-thigh one third of uh, middle, middle one third of the thigh. And this is the ampule. It has been shown before also. And uh, the life-saving medication is adrenaline intramuscular. So if adrenaline is not ready, while the adrenaline is on the way, if possible, 
you have to stop the exposure of the allergen. If patient is already on intra intravascular uh, drug, then you can stop the infusion and you have to remove the, uh, the giving IV set also. And patient, uh, you have to position the patient correctly whenever possible, supine the patient and uh, with or without elevation of the feet. If patient is having difficulty in breathing, then you can prop up the patient. If patient is a pregnant lady, then the, the suitable position is left lateral position because uh, otherwise there can be, if patient, if you keep the patient supine, there can be aorto uh, cable compression. And if patient is unconscious, the recovery position is the best position. So the diagrams will show you how to supine the patient and elevate the leg again. And if patient is having difficulty in breathing, prop up the patient and don't allow patient to stand or sit up. And uh, you can start giving them high flow oxygen. And at the same time, uh, check for airway breathing circulation. So that would tell you whether the patient has got any compromise of airway and if there is with the patient has got increased work work of breathing wheezing tachycardia fatigue or cyanosis or saturation of less than 94 that would suggest uh, breathing is affected and uh, low blood pressure uh, tachycardia and if patient is in shock that is then the patient's circulation is affected yeah once adrenaline is ready you give the adrenaline so the dose is 0.3 to 0.5 milligram. Uh, the adult dose is 0.5 milligram. And uh, how do you give? It's intramuscularly. And the site is anterolateral aspects of the mid thigh. And the timing is very much important. Whenever the adrenal is available, you get it, give it sooner. And it is much more effective if given before shock is established. When you know there is signs of anaphylaxis, you give it straight. And if there is delay of more than 20 minutes, after the onset of uh, anaphylaxis, there will be, the prognosis will be bad and patient will be uh, uh, in danger. So you, therefore you have to decide on adrenaline as soon as possible and give it straight away. And though we have already discussed what are the differential diagnosis for anaphylaxis, it could be myocardial infarction or any other shock or any other uh, acute severe asthma, but uh, the intramuscular adrenaline won't do any harm to those situations. Therefore, uh, even you suspect any other pathology like uh, myocardial infarction, you can give uh, intramuscular adrenaline. Yeah, how do you give? So when you give uh, adrenaline, you have to use a long enough needle to penetrate the skin and the fat because some patients are bigger, they have bigger thighs. So you have to give with long needles. Uh, the Ideally, you can use green needle with 21 gauge or blue needle with 23 gauge needle. And it should not be given to subcutaneously, it should be given intramuscularly. Yeah, why this drug is so important? And we know what are the uh, pathology behind the, what are the pathological changes behind the anaphylaxis. Uh, the, this is a miracle drug that will correct all those mechanisms. It, the adrenal would act on alpha adrenoreceptors and would reverse vasodilatation and tissue edema, and it would act on beta adrenoreceptors, will reverse the bronchospasm uh, that would uh, dilate the broncho bronchial tree and increase the force of myocardial contraction and suppressors histamine and leukotriene release and also in inhibit mast cell activation. So the, basically the adrenal will, adrenaline will act on all the mechanisms of anaphylaxis and that will reverse the anaphylaxis. If patient has got bronchospasm or airway obstruction, again, if patient comes only with Bronchospasm only with systemic uh, uh, the only systemic uh, manifestation is bronchospasm. In that case, the best treatment for bronchospasm is intramuscular adrenaline. 
And if patient has got upper airway obstruction due to laryngeal edema, again, the first line is intramuscular adrenaline, followed by you can give adjunct treatment uh, of adrenaline, you can uh, nebulize the patient. The, if you are nebulizing the patient, the dose is 5 ml of uh, 1 milligram per ml adrenaline. That is, you can use 5 vials to nebulize the patient with adrenaline. But you have to make sure that you, you have to give the intramuscular adrenaline first and then work on uh, nebulizing. So is there a place for bronchodilators? Yeah. If uh, once you start nebulizing and then uh, if, if there is bronchospasm further, then you can nebulize the patient with bronchodilators like salbutamol and no ipratropium. But make sure that it is done only after intramuscular adrenaline. If patient has got asthma, a known patient with asthmatic, because uh, some of the patients with asthma, they are more prone to get food allergies. Uh, when they come with difficulty in breathing without uh, circulatory collapse, then we are not very sure whether we are dealing with acute life threatening asthma or whether we are dealing with anaphylaxis. If you have any doubt that we are dealing with anaphylaxis, the first thing is to give intramuscular adrenaline and make sure that salbutamol by nebulization is not useful for upper airway obstruction or uh, to correct the shock in anaphylaxis. So when it comes to oxygen, the initially you have to give the maximum concentration of oxygen available so you can use a face mask with an oxygen reservoir. And uh, once you are stabilizing the patient, um, you can uh, achieve the oxygen concentration uh, of the saturation of 94 to 98, uh, depending on the patient, you can adjust the oxygen flow rate. And in a, if you know that patient has got hypercapnic respiratory failure, in that case, the, uh, the target would be 88 to 92 saturation. What about, what about intravascular, intravenous fluids? The, you have to secure the IV access and rapid IV fluid bolus is indicated. So what is the amount? 500 to 1 litre uh, of normal saline as the first uh, intra intravenous solution. And you have to monitor the response. And uh, if, if, you are, if you are unable to uh, get intravascular intra intravenous access, then you can use the intraosseous IO route. But ensure a further dose of intramuscular adrenaline is administered after five minutes if breathing or circulatory symptoms persist while you are attempting to secure IV or IO access. Yes, now we have given the first dose of uh, intramuscular adrenaline and then you have started the patient on intravascular fluid. So you assess the patient's response. How do you check? So we know that the two important uh, uh, systemic effects are uh, circulation and this, uh, the respiration. So you look for the blood pressure and the saturation. Yes, if, pa if patient's breathing and circulatory problems are persisting, and if patient is not responding to the first dose of adrenaline, then you can repeat the second dose of adrenaline in five minutes. The dose is the same dose, 0.3 to 0.5, and the same route that is intramuscular. Uh, you can give the second dose to the same site or the contralateral uh, type. Yeah, this uh, algorithm is very important, and this is uh, taken from the UK Resuscitation Council. So when you suspect anaphylaxis, you diagnose the anaphylaxis. We have already discussed that. Then you call for the help and you position the patient and remove the trigger once the adrenaline is available. Then once adrenaline is available, you give intramuscular adrenaline and establish the airway breathing circulation and start monitoring the patient. And if there is no response, you go for the second adrenaline intramuscular injection. And if patient is not responding, then we'll move on to the next next uh, uh, part, we call it refractory anaphylaxis. So what is refractory anaphylaxis? 
When a patient does not respond to a second dose of adrenaline, it is called refractory anaphylaxis. How do you identify refractory anaphylaxis? Uh, and you have to, uh, when you identify the refractory anaphylaxis, you have to escalate the treatment and you may have to look for, as a junior doctor, you have to ask for senior help, uh, if available, anesthetic help or critical care help is needed. And uh, the somebody uh, helping you can uh, uh, find an ICU for the patient. So it is defined as anaphylaxis requiring ongoing treatment due to persistent respiratory or cardiovascular uh, symptoms despite two appropriate doses of intramuscular adrenaline. So what are the reasons for refractory anaphylaxis? Uh, there are a few uh, reasons. One is delayed or insufficient delivery of adrenaline. That is the most commonest cause uh, for the refractory anaphylaxis. The second one is progression of a reaction due to ongoing release of inflammatory mediators due to severe anaphylaxis reaction inside the body. The third one is diminished response to repeated adrenaline doses. That is called tachy tachyphylaxis, but, is, but that is uncommon. Yeah, uh, so when there is a refractory anaphylaxis, you have to uh, start intra venous adrenaline. So far we have given intramuscular adrenaline, now we are moving to intra intravenous uh, adrenaline. So uh, why we are using intra intra intravenous uh, adrenaline? To optimize the delivery of the adrenaline to the patient system. And uh, you have to seek urgent expert help to establish a low dose intravascular intravenous adrenaline infusion should be given only by experienced specialist in an appropriate setting. And you need to dilute adrenaline uh, and you have to infuse, you can infuse it via peripheral intravenous cannula. Or if it is not available, you can uh, give it OS uh, until the central venous uh, access is obtained. If there is a delay, starting intra, intravenous adrenaline, then you can continue to repeat IM adrenaline after five minutes until the infusion has been started. Yeah, how do you prepare the intravenous adrenaline? So you take one ml of one in thousand adrenaline and add it to 100 ml of normal saline. How do you administer it? You administer it directly and do, don't piggyback onto another line unless, unless there is anti reflux, uh, reflux valve. Or don't infuse on the same side as a BP cuff, BP cuff because that will, uh, uh, there won't be continuous infusion if when you apply the blood pressure cuff. And the starting dose is. 0.5 to 1 ml per kg per hour, depending on the severity. If, if you are dealing with the moderate severity, then you can start with 0.5 ml per kg per hour. If you are dealing with a severe anaphylaxis, then you can start with 1 ml per kg per hour infusion. And you can titrate up or down according to the response of the patient. The continuous monitoring uh, with ECG, pulse oximetry, and blood pressure is important at least every five minutes. And the weaning is set up when the symptoms improve and uh, you can reduce the infusion aiming for 50% of the starting dose. And one hour after the resolution of all symptoms and signs, reduce the infusion rate progressively over, progressively over 30 minutes and then you can stop the infusion. And even after you stopping the infusion, you need to monitor closely for recurrences. If there is any signs of recurrence, you may have to restart the infusion. When it comes to fluid boluses, uh, so if you have already given the initial point, uh, then uh, you, have to, you have to give a few more. Uh, the the rapid, rapid IV boluses, 
the bolus is again 500 to 1000 milliliter per bolus and uh, the, what are the, uh, the the crystalloid the ideal crystalloids are uh, sodium chloride the normal saline, saline or hartmann solution uh, you can go up to three to five liters in an adult because there will be a lot of hypo uh, due to vasodilatation there will be a patient will be hypovolemic so you can go up to three to five liters <clears throat> and uh, severe total low upper uh, then uh, the then we'll move on to the uh, correcting of hypoxia uh, the, when it comes to airway if there is partial upper airway obstruction you can nebulize with adrenaline we have already discussed that but the tissue oxygenation is more important than tracheal intubation if there is severe or total airway obstruction you may have to uh, intubate the patient and you may have to seek for the the most uh, experienced person in the, uh, the clinical setup and when it comes to breathing uh, treat severe respiratory symptoms that are refracted to intramuscular adrenaline with adrenaline infusion uh, so we have already started uh, intro, uh, IV adrenaline for uh, refractory shock and nebulize with bronchodilator therapy and uh, the, you can use salbutamol or Iprovin and if patient is not responding then you can try intravenous bronchodilator therapy like salbutamol or aminophilin but make sure don't give uh, magnesium because that can cause uh, hypo uh, the, the vasodilatation and that will worsen the hypo uh, hy <coughs> hypovolemia then uh, low blood pressure if patient has uh, ap apnea you can uh, ventilate the patient with ambu bag and tracheal intubation is needed if even though you have tried everything, if patient developed arrest, then you have to follow the ALS algorithm where you can give uh, intravenous boluses of adrenaline as per in the algorithm for cardiac arrest. Okay, thank you. And uh, the, the next part will be done by Dr. Chamila Dalpadadu. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Suranga. Uh, let me share uh, my slides. So um, my task is to discuss uh, what to do if the patient is stable. We are hoping uh, with all our management that we already discussed that patients would stabilize and, uh, and it has to be done very, very quickly. So, so far we have discussed about the first line therapy, the IM adrenaline, positioning the patient, administering hypooxygen, giving uh, resusc fluid resuscitation, and monitoring the patient carefully. As Dr. Sulanga mentioned, um, continuous patient monitoring is very important. Uh, cardiac monitoring if available, heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate, oxygen saturation, and most importantly, the level of consciousness. Uh, detecting restlessness, these are the uh, signs of ongoing uh, anaphylaxis. And auscultating or wheezing, and seeing whether the patient has recovered, all are very important in the management. So we will discuss about something called biphasic reaction. Now, uh, I'm sure all of you have uh, experienced this. The moment patient gets uh, anaphylaxis, the patient is very prone to get another attack. So this happens, unfortunately, when the patient appears to be getting well. We all relax. We, if you can remember the patient, we discussed case number two. Our classic example, the patient is getting uh, better with uh, uh, keftraxone for pneumonia, probably in the third cubicle or maybe in the floor, continuing IV antibiotics, and patients, patient get an anaphylaxis. Yes, we manage, and then we relax, but we have to monitor the patient because anaphylaxis can appear to re resolve, but uh, recurrence of symptoms several hours later 
in the absence of further allergen exposure is known as biphasic reaction. So up to about uh, 5 to 5, uh, 20% of patients with anaphylaxis have a biphasic reaction. And the uh, second phase can happen immediately uh, or later. And 50% of the biphasic uh, reactions occur within the first 6 to 12 hours. But um, it is known to occur any time after the first reaction and up to even 72 hours. And patients with anaphylaxis need to be observed. So this is very important to remember. We have to um, educate the nursing staff as well, the importance of uh, monitoring. And this is especially so in patients with severe reactions and those who have required multiple doses of uh, epinephrine. So uh, biphasic reactions are known to associate with a history of prior anaphylaxis, or uh, if the uh, precipitant is unknown, as we saw in the uh, our last patient, and of course, symptoms of diarrhea or any other GI symptoms, and especially with the ongoing wheezing. And most importantly, if the first adrenaline dose has been delayed more than 60 minutes, then these kind of patients are very likely to go on to have a biphasic reaction. And um, it says it's less likely when food is the trigger. However, uh, we have to monitor. So why we get a biphasic reaction is due to the ongoing um, uh, inflammatory mediator release, especially the uh, especially all the uh, inflammatory mediators which are released from the cells during anaphylaxis, um, like activation of the complement pathway, delayed activation, and so on. Okay? So uh, while monitoring, uh, if there is, a, there is recurrence of anaphylaxis, we have to manage as per the uh, earlier protocol. And we'll move on to discuss a little bit about the other medications because we are very familiar in administering antihistamines and corticosteroids in case of allergy. But when it comes to anaphylaxis, the story is a little bit different because antihistamines, the only value is for reducing the itching or the skin rash. Uh, so if you administer antihistamines during anaphylaxis, it can have detrimental effects such as drowsiness uh, with you know, chlorophenyramine. Uh, chlor, uh, you can get severe drowsiness, which is not warranted when you're managing a patient with anaphylaxis because we don't know whether the patient is deteriorating or not. So what is recommended is non-sedating antihistamines given orally if the there is severe skin uh, rash or itching. And furthermore, rapid intravenous administration of antihistamines such as uh, chlorpheniramine can also cause hypotension worsening the whole scenario. And uh, we can use the other H2 blockers such as cimetidine, ranitidine, or famotidine uh, if it is needed. And going on to glucocorticoids. Now, this has been a dilemma for long years whether to give steroids, but the current recommendation is the routine use of corticosteroids to treat anaphylaxis is not advised according to the uh, UK resuscitation uh, uh, guidelines, uh, latest 2021, it is not recommended. So, uh, because there's no proven value, and it can possibly be harmful as well, because you know about all the side effects of glucocorticoids, increased infections, hyperglycemia, and so on. Uh, but there may be some effect in giving glucocorticoids, especially if there is refractory asthma or acute severe asthma in the background, because we all it's there in the guidelines. And uh, why we are discouraging glucocorticoids is because it delays the administration of adrenaline. The primary aim is to give adrenaline, not hydrocortisone. So this has to go to the doctors, not only the doctors, but to the nurses as well. First and foremost, I am adrenaline and thereafter the other management. So 
uh, we have been uh, traditionally giving glucocorticoids thinking that we can prevent the protracted symptoms and um, particularly with asthmatic symptoms. And of course, uh, whether we could prevent this biphasic reaction, but there is no evidence. A lot of people have done systematic reviews, meta-analyses, but there is no proven evidence to support whether glucocorticoid would prevent biphasic reaction. So the only place is where when there is a severe, acute severe asthma in the background, okay? So important things to remember would be antihistamines are not recommended as part of the initial emergency treatment of anaphylaxis and antihistamines have no role in treating respiratory or cardiovascular symptoms of anaphylaxis because we know the pathophysiology, there is no place in giving antihistamine. It would only block the histamine, whereas there are multiple other inflammatory mediators um, which are responsible in uh, uh, anaphylaxis. So corticosteroids are no longer advised for the routine emergency treatment of anaphylaxis uh, because neither at antihistamine or non glucocorticoids are of value in the acute management. So this mistake we have to prevent from happening. And there are other therapies, like for example, if a patient had been on beta blockers, the response to IM adrenaline would be not so good because their uh, beta receptors are already blocked. Despite limited evidence, uh, we can administer parenteral glucagon because glucagon would bypass the beta receptors and directly have ionotropic and chronotropic effect on the heart. Um, and uh, Dr. Suranga already talked about the nebulization and with the beta-2 adrenaline receptor agonists as well as adrenaline nebulization for ongoing respiratory symptoms. Now, moving on, now, if, when the patient becomes better, we have to educate the patient. So identifying the allergen is very important, and we have to advise the patient to avoid it for life, and we have to give clear documentation. And the UK guidelines actually um, advocate for prescribing Auto injectors, adrenaline auto in injectors. And it seems appropriate for all patients who have had anaphylaxis because this is a life threatening complication which can recur. And uh, the problem here is unavailability, the cost. And uh, I mean, in Sri Lanka, it's going to be very, very difficult, right? Um, and furthermore, in the management of patient who has had anaphylaxis, we have to think about changing some of his drugs like beta blockers or AZ inhibitors, and maybe switching on to other medication, antihypertensive medications. And we have to educate the patients to look out for precipitating factors, uh, such as alcohol, acute infections, exercise, uh, stress, pre-menstrual uh, tension, disruption of uh, routine, uh, the patient's normal routine, like going on vacations, and of course, other medications and uh, new food. And food preservatives are notorious as well. Who has had uh, anaphylaxis, we have to educate for them uh, to look out for these uh, triggers. And this all important question of when to discharge. Obviously, when there is full clinically uh, recovery. And uh, we have to be really sure that there's no chance of biphasic reaction. And of course, it's a good practice for the patient to be assessed by a senior clinician in the ward before you arrange the discharge. And of course, we have to make sure the patient is ready for discharge, not only clinically, but the patient and family to be educated, uh, a specialist referral uh, for immunological studies. It's available in Sri Lanka. And of course, with proper documentation, not only the card, maybe there are clinic records as well, because that is the one which is being carried by the patient throughout. And EpiPen, 
when indicated, and some patients may be able to get it uh, from a broad even, so we have to give them the option. And um, I just put down some take home messages. Uh, the adrenaline work best when it's given early, as we have predicted from the beginning, and delayed administration is associated with protracted reactions and adverse effects. We are very worried to give adrenaline because of cardiac arrhythmias, but this is very rare with IM group. So if you give the correct dose IM, there's very little chance of arrhythmia due to adrenaline. But of course, ongoing anaphylaxis and can lead to cardiac arrest, as uh, Dr. Suranga um, nicely explained. So cardiac arrest can occur not due to IM adrenaline uh, leading to arrhythmia, but due to the anaphylaxis. And we have to make sure adrenaline is available at places where anaphylaxis could occur, especially the medication trolley, immunization clinics, day treatment units, and so on. And we have to probably uh, display the anaphylaxis algorithms in your wards and clinic setup and training the healthcare staff. And it's not only the nurses, it's the healthcare aides, even the cleaning staff. Everybody should have an idea what is anaphylaxis, even the general public, school children, everybody. Because I, I was just uh, thinking about this case too, where this patient was probably uh, in the third cubicle maybe soon after the patient's recovery, maybe the uh, nursing staff would you know, say, now that the adrenaline is given, shall we get the patient to the acute cubicle? Now, if the patient stands up, probably the trolley cannot be you know, navigated through that busy ward to the rear uh, cubicle where the patient is, and you get, it, get this patient up and patients get a bite basic reaction and collapse and die, that can happen. So, so not only, uh, it's not enough that we are educated, but we have to educate the nursing officers and the other staff members as well about anaphylaxis. It's a must must that you all are uh, leaders in your own setup and please uh, disseminate this message. So um, we would uh, stop at this point and uh, if there are any questions, please put on the chat and um, uh, First of all, I have to, uh, on behalf of CCP, because I'm one of the uh, current joint secretaries, I would like to thank uh, Professor Pandu Karunanayaka, who's our teacher and who has been a pres uh, president of CCP as well, for taking up this task to organize this um, uh, with a very short notice. So thank you very much, sir. And thank you very much, Dr. Suranga Manegam, also for joining today and uh, sharing your expertise. And I would like to thank the president and the council of the CCP. So if there are any questions, please uh, put it on the Q&A chat box. Thank you. Uh, there were some questions. One, uh, one question that uh, I think I answered, I don't know whether I answered it correctly. Suranga, you may be able to add to that. Uh, one attendee asked uh, uh, about using salbutamol or uh, aminophilin for severe bronchospasm. And the answer that I gave is that in the setting of anaphylaxis, uh, adrenaline is still superior to either salbutamol or uh, amenophilin. Uh, what is your view, Suranga? Do you agree with that or do you have a different view? Yeah, the first thing is uh, intramuscular adrenaline. And uh, then uh, if there is upper airway obstruction, uh, we can try uh, adrenaline nebulization. And uh, then if uh, the bronchospasm persists, uh, go for uh, nebulization with salbutamol and or Iprovent. So they, they do not exactly tell which one is superior, but salbutamol as well as Iprovent, both can be used. But the first thing is intramuscular adrenaline. The second, if there is upper airway obstruction, go for nebulization of adrenaline and then the nebulization with other bronchodilators. Yeah. Actually, uh, IEM adrenaline uh, would be very useful in even life-threatening asthma, although we don't normally use it very frequently. Uh, so that's about that question. There was another question about the kind of needle to use for the IM injection, but I think Suranga asked that, asked that question during your talk, so that is okay. Then there's a question, uh, uh, could you comment on pre-medication before antivenom administration? Is it really useful? 
um, I just um, uh, I just looked up the internet for a very for a nice good uh, review or uh, systematic review of this very important topic. Uh, there is an article, a journal called Journal of Venom and Animal Toxins in, in uh, I don't know what the full title of the journal is, uh, but uh, there's a nice, uh, uh, here we are, Journal of Venomous Animals and Toxins, including Tropical Diseases. Uh, I will type the uh, reference. You will find that it, has a, it is an open access article and it gives all the studies done. And if, you, if I give a short answer to you, it looks like there is no established benefit um, uh, of uh, hydrocortisone or uh, antihistamines uh, or adrenaline, although it is possible that uh, adrenaline pre-medication may be helpful, but I won't ask you to do that. I just ask you to read the article instead, that will be better. Uh, then someone's asking uh, what to do with the emergency department if there's a mild localized skin reaction or generalized skin reaction without uh, if features of systemic involvement, of course, you can't give adrenaline, you can give antihistamines in that situation. Uh, what is the dose of glucagon? Uh, I don't know whether, uh, Tamila, do you happen to know the dose? Uh, I, I, some, Tamila, of course, mentioned it is not an established treatment, it's something that we can try. I don't know whether you know the dose. Uh, dose, is, uh, dose is one milligram. Usually, we ah. use the dose of one milligram. Uh, okay. for, Children, uh, the age less than 20, 20, 25 milligram, uh, 25 kilos, we can use the half dose, 0. 0.5. Otherwise, for adults, one milligram. Okay. Uh, then someone's asking about differentiating anaphylaxis from Cooney syndrome. I, I mean, I don't know, honestly, if I've never seen this syndrome myself. I suppose you have to manage anaphylaxis, first of all, to make sure there's no shock or uh, uh, hypoxia, because that should be detrimental to the Coronary syndrome. Yeah, uh, is, yeah. the the is where uh, uh, you uh, the you the there's a patient with uh, coronary vascular the, the, the with uh, with anaphylaxis causing coronary spasm. Where the, they, usually they do have uh, normal coronary arteries. So the first you manage for the anaphylaxis and with other uh, supportive measures. Uh, that is the management. I think that person is asking how to manage Cooney syndrome where you can use uh, other modalities of treatment and as well as uh, for um, the, uh, other, uh, the, not the, uh, the, the, usually they do have uh, uh, normal coronaries. So some of the patients may have underlying coronary disease and the anaphyla anaphylaxis may have worsened the uh, ischemia to the, con uh, the heart that might cause um, Cooney syndrome, uh, but uh, the manage with the basically the management is anaphylaxis management. Right. Someone's asking, what about oral non sedative antihistamine effectiveness in a patient with gut edema if the patient is unable to take oral sample if vomiting is present? Uh, well, I think the gut edema. You have to differentiate the mucosal edema from the edema of the bowel wall because it's only when the mucosal edema is present that uh, absorption would be hampered for of any oral medication. Uh, but of course, if you I mean, if the patient is having bowel edema, uh, I think the patient would be in, in very bad situation because uh, the bowel, as I mentioned, the bowel is a very long organ, and if there is gut edema, the patient would probably have a significant amount of uh, extravasation of fluid with hypovolemia. It will be a bit like a, like a dengue leakage phase with uh, dengue shock syndrome or something like some, something very similar with even uh, hemoconcentration. So in that situation also, I think it is much more important to focus on the hypoxia and the shock rather than about uh, giving uh, antihistamines. That's what I feel. Um, then there is, uh, what is the role of adrenaline? One in 10,000. Um, Suranga, do you want to answer that question? Uh, that is only for the, uh, uh, we use one in 10,000 uh, during the cardiac arrest, where uh, uh, that is the only, uh, only place where we give uh, uh, boluses, uh, IV boluses. So when we use one in 10,000, otherwise for the anaphylaxis purpose, we use one in 10,000, one in 1,000. 1, yeah. So anaphylaxis one in 1,000 intramuscularly, uh, refractory anaphylaxis, you give an intravenous infusion, 
And in cardiac arrest, we give the one in 10,000 IV bolus. So adrenaline is given in three different ways in the three different conditions. Uh, EpiPen is a short needle, uh, not very long, and therefore it is subcutaneous. Uh, Ramindu is asking. I suppose that's an important point because if there's a big fat layer in the thigh, uh, you would have uh, difficulty reaching the muscle. Uh, and if you don't reach the muscle, it becomes a subcutaneous in injection, and that is not very effective because uh, subcutaneously the alpha receptors go into action and causes base of constriction and reduces absorption. But if you give it intramuscularly, the reason why you give intramuscularly is because muscle has beta-2 receptors and therefore it causes local waste dilatation. And that's how adrenaline given IM is very quickly absorbed. So we have to aim for the muscle. I suppose if you if you can't give it into the thigh, you could try to give it into the deltoid if the needle is not long enough. Uh, so Suranga, would you agree with that or do you have a, another answer? No, no I, I do agree with yeah. Okay. Sound, uh, sir, um, uh, they have uh, mentioned like, if the only available adrenaline, say like in the ward staff or maybe out there, if the only available adrenaline is the patient's AV pain, go with it. But in uh, established anaphylaxis, we have to always go for the, uh, join the uh, uh, adrenaline into the uh, syringe and administer properly. So uh, if the patient is carrying an EpiPen while you get the other drugs, probably you can administer because there are maybe technical or mechanical uh, errors, so we don't know, but uh, uh, we can rely on that till we get our proper adrenaline supply. Yeah, but uh, even when we use the EpiPen, try to make it intramuscular rather than subcutaneous. Yes. How to stabilize muscles during anaphylaxis? Um, um, Suranga or Chamila, do you have any suggestions about that? Uh, ad so adrenaline has an effect on mast cell stabilization. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, uh, so that's why we, it's not only for the cardiac or the vascular pathology, but also uh, stabilizing the um, response, allergic response. That, yeah, we that is through the beta 2 uh, receptors. Yes. And I, I think uh, uh, this person would have asked the question because we were not recommending giving hydrocortisone. So we usually use hydrocortisone with the view that it will stabilize masses. But I don't think you have to worry too much about that. Just give adrenaline it will do all the jobs that you need in anaphylaxis. The important point is to give adrenaline as soon as possible and to give it intramuscularly in the right dose. Uh, are always skin manifestations present in allergic reactions? Uh, of course not. Sometimes it is not. Sometimes it can be uh, lip swelling, tongue swelling, uvula swelling, flow of the mouth swelling, can be a glottis or laryngeal, uh, and so on. Okay. Um, like uh, Peradenia. Uh, yeah, so there's a question about GI side effects coming big and prominently, despite the other three systems. You will give, will you give adrenaline? I, I think that's a very good question. It's a very difficult question to answer. We also had a bit of a debate between the three of us about what to say to this because. If you have GI side effects, it basically means uh, even if the airways and breathing and circulation are not normal, uh, I'm sorry, even if airways, breathing and circulation are normal, if the patient has GI side effects, uh, it's, a, it's a very difficult situation. The patient is probably almost at anaphylaxis. So let's put it that way. So, I mean, uh, some, some uh, uh, one guideline actually did define this as anaphylaxis whereas another one didn't. So, um, I mean, we can't say it's anaphylaxis, uh, and we were a little reluctant to recommend giving adrenaline intramuscular when the blood pressure is normal, when the pulse rate is normal, when the, uh, when the breathing is normal, when the, when the airway is normal. We didn't feel confident to say, we don't feel happy to say to give adrenaline, but we also agree this is a bad situation when the GI tract is involved, so better keep your adrenaline ready and better be to give it uh, with a very very low threshold, very uh, you know as uh, as soon as you get the first evidence of uh, airway or breathing or circulation problems, um, I, I suppose it, it's it's a call, it's a clinical call for the clinician looking after the patient. If you did give adrenaline IM in that situation, I don't think I can find fault with you. And it's a very difficult and important question. Um, so you have to sort of do the best you can with very close monitoring and be ready to give it at the earliest possible moment. Uh, should we give oxygen to all patients in anaphylaxis, even if the SpO2 is about 94? 
I think yes, uh, Surang, what do you think? Of course, we won't have to. Uh, yeah, I, I also saw the uh, question. I I would say yes because uh, uh, the we uh, the we are in a hurry and we we won't be able to measure the exact uh, hypo, uh, the saturation at the outset so we start with uh, uh, oxygen then you can uh, tail off you can titrate up or down depending on the saturation the first thing is if you are dealing with anaphylaxis then you start with oxygen and then uh, tail uh, the titrate up or down Right. Is there a place for 5% dextrose in anaphylaxis? I don't think so. Uh, no, they specifically say don't give uh, dextrose. Uh, the, because the, they have to talk of uh, hypoglycemia in the situation. Yes, yes, yes. Right. Uh, without itching and skin manifestation, and anaphylaxis can be present with straight system manifestations, isn't it? Yes, you are right, Niluka. Uh, all those skin in manifestation and mucous membrane manifestations are present in uh, 80 to 90 percent of patients. There are situations when the skin and mucous membranes are not involved, but the airway breathing circulation is abnormal. Therefore, it's very helpful, but it's not always present. You don't have to wait for it for it to diagnose uh, anaphylaxis. There would be other features of allergy, for example, exposure to the allergen, the, the rapidity of the onset, the rapidity of the progression. All those things indicate it's a, it's a type 1 reaction. Uh, is EpiPen contain 0.3? I think it's 0.5, right? Is uh, EpiPen? Uh, there are several, so 0.3 to 0.5. Uh, even the smaller ones are available. 0.15 are also available. Can we use methylene blue in refractory low BB? Surango or Chamila? Methylene blue. Uh... We haven't come across like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I also can't tie the two together. Okay, so that, those are the questions uh, which are there in the Q&A. I think we have answered all of them. Um, so, Duminda, um, I, I think we have covered the ground. Yes, uh, Panduka, Suranga, and Tamela. Thank you very much for doing it on behalf of the college. And uh, I think we can close the... Uh, session today and of course all remember that this will be put on recording will be put on our youtube channel so make sure that your colleagues looks at it if who have not joined it and if you want to recapture the things please go and uh, go into our youtube when it's over probably by next week it should be there on youtube so thank you very much for all who have joined with us today and uh, special thanks to the three resource persons thank you